Hey y'all, happy Tuesday. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. How y'all doing? Y'all, we are literally progressing through this month and we're going at a record speed to me. How y'all doing? Welcome to Strategy Tuesday. Let me know when you come in. If you can hear me, let me know if you can see me clearly. Um, I literally have one hour to get you all of this information. And so we cannot afford to delay today. Um, I hope you all are having a fantastic day, just as I am, and have come full of expectation. Hey, Chantel, full of expectation for the strategies that come from heaven, right? And that have been hidden in the Bible for such a long time. And, you know, I, 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 I'm always in awe when I read the Bible, uh, what I see, because you can always read the same thing and you will see something completely different. That is the beauty of the Bible. And that is the beauty of Bible study. And so today on Strategy Tuesday, hey, it's a lay girl. I need to send you a text. Uh, today on Strategy Tuesday, we, uh, we're going to be building on um, the previous two teachings that we did. So the week before last, we tackled, um, the week before last, we tackled Abraham and last week or the last strategy Tuesday, we tackled Isaac. And because I'm a, I like to look at stuff con, in a continual manner, we're looking at Jacob today. So today's um, today's mentor is Jacob. And y'all, um, please like the video as you come on. Let other people know I am on so that we can get these strategies and dominate in 2024. That's what I'm talking about because we're about to enter into 20. We're about to enter into Q2. And we don't need to be stuck in Q2. You know what I mean? So here we are. Um, today, y'all, we are going to be studying from Genesis 30. Genesis 30. Um, I don't know if any of my mods are on, but I'm going to do my best to drop this in the chat. Please get your Bibles. We're studying together. Don't ever take my word for anything I'm saying. I could be lying to you. Um, so go ahead and get your Bibles. We're going um, from Genesis 30. And we're going to kind of scan through the entire text, but our strategy is going to come specifically from, from verse 32 through 42. All right, y'all. So um, in, 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 the, in the portion of scripture that we're going to study specifically, this portion actually falls under the category of Jacob's flock increase. And so if you're new to my channel, hey, y'all, I always forget to do this. I have a lot of new people on my channel. Hey, I'm Dr. Brianna Whiteside. I'm an English professor for a few more months and I am all things kingdom and Jesus. And so I just wanted to say, hey, real quick and let me back up. If you don't know, I also, um, when I study or when I teach Bible study, I study out of the KJV, but I read out of the NIV. So everything you're gonna hear me read is gonna come out of the NIV and everything I'm gonna study specifically if I'm doing a word study, it's going to come out of the KJV because that is um, the version that more specifically or more closely aligns with the Greek and Hebrew words. All right. So for the portion of scripture that we are going to be looking at today, it falls under the category of Jacob's flock increase. And so when we generally hear of Jacob, it's either because of his trickster ways, his vision of angels ascending or descending, or his treatment of Leah and labor for Lee. Um, for his treatment of Leah, but labor for Rachel. However, rarely, if ever, have we studied his strategy for increase, right? I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Jacob's strategy for increase. It was more so the other things that I just mentioned, but he had, hold on. So something is popping up. Let me put this on focus. Okay. But he does have a strategy for increase. And I think that is something that we should pay more attention to. Um, and so this is what we're going to study for Jacob. This study builds on the last two strategy sessions, as I said, where we studied Abraham and Isaac. And it takes into consideration why uh, God consistently says that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In addition, it takes into consideration Jesus' reprimand in Matthew 8, verse 11 through 12 where he says, I say unto you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
So all of the aforementioned occurrences or factors prompted me to study one, why God states that he is the God of these three men, but two, why Jesus mentions that the people, other people will take their places at the table with these specific men. So in the study on Abraham, we learned that his obedience secured personal and generational wealth. Similarly, in the study on Isaac, we learned that his obedience secured personal wealth, which, which we learned that he reaped a hundredfold in that same year, and also generational wealth. And we learned that he reinstated the water flow from the wells that were clogged up by the Philistines and renamed them, which was an act of reclaiming the wealth that was stolen from his lineage. But what about Jacob? God names him and Jesus names him, right? So could it be that these three men have something to do with wealth and prosperity? And also when I started studying and you'll see how this correlates you all, we can't just think about Abraham and Isaac without considering Jacob because we have to consider Joseph, right? And we know that Joseph was one of Jacob's kids. So we can't skip these Jacob, which we often do, and go to Joseph, who was manager of all the things, because Jacob and what he did set Joseph up for what he was able to do when he managed Pharaoh's house. Y'all with me? So in Genesis um, 30, verse 25 through 31, we learn that Jacob is ready to go back home. Right. Rachel has just given birth to Joseph, who we also studied, and Jacob is ready to relocate. Laban, however, isn't prepared to allow him to do so uh, because he realizes that God only blessed him because of Jacob's proximity. I find it even more fascinating in this passage of, of scripture that the way Laban learns of the reason that God blesses him was through divination. And if you want to go ahead and look that up, it's in verse 27. Laban literally admits I practiced divination to see why I was so successful. And I was so successful because of you. Either way, Laban is not ready to let go of his arrangement. So he asked Jacob to name his price, right? Meaning he asked Jacob, how much would it cost to keep him and to continue making him wealthy? To this, Jacob responds that it's time for him to build up the wealth for his own family and to stop making everyone else more profitable. And this drops us into the passages of scripture um, that we're going to start studying. So verse 30, verse 30 says, and this is Jacob speaking directly to Laban. He says, the little you had before I came has increased greatly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now, when may I do something for my own household? In desperation, Laban asks, what shall I give you, right? I know you want to do something for your own household, but what can I give you to keep making me more profitable, to keep you operating within my system? Jacob, realizing the opportunity that he had and knows that he has the upper hand, makes it clear that he doesn't want Laban to give him anything, but he will cut a deal. And this is where we get our first strategy. Your first strategy, and I'll drop this in the chat, is to secure your own household and lineage. I know. This is, this seems like it's counter Christian, but as we're going to start seeing, according to Jacob, that he saw that securing his own household and his lineage was important. Remember, if we go back to verse 30, he says, the little you had before I came has increased greatly and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. But now, when may I do something for my own household? So for the people who don't think that God is concerned about your house, your lineage, he is. He's concerned about you too and what you leave for your children's children. So we understand that Jacob worked for Laban because they cut a deal for Rachel. But when that time was up, Jacob was focused on his own lineage. I always say this, y'all. God is concerned about you. He is concerned about the, your legacy and what you leave for your kids and your grandkids and their grandkids, right? So in this text, we know that the only reason Jacob served for 14 years was due to a faulty agreement, but this was always about legacy. How do we know that this is about legacy and Jacob's story is also about legacy? God speaks in generations. He is the God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham obeyed God and secured his legacy. Isaac obeyed God and secured his legacy. We're about to see Jacob move in the same way to secure his legacy. 
So let's go ahead and read. We're going to actually walk through uh, blocks of the rest of these scriptures and then pull out strategies as we go through blocks. So the first block we're going to study um, is verse 32 um, through 33. It says, let this is Jacob speaking. He, it says, let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark colored lamb and every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my they will be my wages. And my honesty will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on the wages you have paid me, any goat in my possession that is not speckled or spotted or any lamb that is not dark colored will be considered stolen. So let's break this down. Let's go back to verse 32. Jacob tells Laban, let me go through all your flocks today and remove from every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark colored lamb and every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my wages. Your second strategy is to use what may seem outwardly insignificant. Strategy number two, after you have decided to secure your own household and lineage, you have to decide to use what may seem outwardly insignificant. This is what gets a lot of people caught up and hindered because we think, oh, this is normal. This is usual. This is, this is, this is normal. People aren't going to pay me for this. People aren't going to see this as valuable. But we're about to see that Jacob is about to use something that seems invaluable to build generational wealth, okay? So we can assume here that the number of unspotted and unspeckled flock far outweighed the number of spotted and speckled flock because Laban was greedy, right? He wouldn't have allowed J Jacob to have the upper hand so easily. And Jacob knew that from their previous dealing. And you know what their previous dealing was. He tricked Jacob into um, laboring an extra seven years for Rachel. So Jacob, knowing that God was with him, came up with a single plan to use what seemed insignificant to Laban to increase wealth. All right. Y'all with me? We're about to enter your into your third strategy. Your third, their third strategy is to prioritize having a good name. Prioritize having a good name. Verse 33 says, and this is Jacob speaking, and my honesty will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on the wages you have paid me, any goat in my possession that, has not, that is not speckled or spotted or any lamb that is not dark colored will be considered stolen. So you must remember as you're ascending, as you're building, as you are moving into whatever God has called you to do, you must remember that being integral and honest, they're still important. Though it may take you a little longer to get what you want, right? Don't fall for the trap of greed that will snatch your good name and your reputation. In fact, I want to also argue, we can also argue this, that greed is what blinded Laban, right? Greed blinded Laban. In ignorance, verse 34 says Laban agreed to Joseph's terms and conditions. Why would Laban say agree to terms and conditions that he knew wouldn't benefit him? He wouldn't. But because Joseph appeared to present him with a strategy that would give Laban and allow Laban to keep the upper hand, Laban said, all right, cool. Whether it felt unfair or not, he said, cool, I'm going to always win. However, Joseph, knowing that this was his nature, decided to stay integral. Your integrity matters. Your character matters. Okay, y'all? Don't be seduced to be unintegral. Your character matters. Verse 35 says, that same day, he removed all the male goats that were streaked or spotted and all the speckled or spotted female goats and that had white on them and all the dark colored lambs, and he placed them in the care of his sons. It stopped? What well, stopped? Okay. So your strategy four from verse 35 is to begin executing the plan immediately. We see here that right after Laban agrees, Jacob removed all the spotted and streaked animals that same day. So the same day the idea came to him, Jacob literally moves into production, right? We see that in the scripture. It says that same day he removed all the male goats that were streaked or spotted. So the same day that the idea came to him and that Laban agreed, Jacob begins moving into production, moving into execution 
on the idea. So we also see that God is here moving invisibly. It was God who gave Jacob the idea that he proposed to Laban. The only thing Jacob had to do was begin to do his part immediately, which the Bible says he did that same day. So what has God told you to do that you're still sitting on that you haven't moved into production on? Because he, give, he gives all of us ideas. He gives all of us. The Bible tells you he loads you with benefits every day. If you ask, he will give it to you. He gives everyone ideas. Some people sit on them. Jacob moves into production immediately. You see what I'm saying here? You can't afford to sit on your ideas, your gifts, your talents, all of the things. Not anymore. You're going to have to move into production today. The same day that God gives you the information, you need to move into production swiftly. This brings us to our fifth strategy. Strategy five, dropping it in the chat. If you have children, bring them into the burgeoning family business. Verse 35 tells us that after Jacob separated the flock, he put his share in the care of his sons, which means he brought them into the family business. So ultimately, he was literally teaching his sons, even as he secured generational wealth, how to become owners and not just workers. How do you think Joseph learned how to manage Pharaoh's house? Where do you think Joseph learned management and ownership strategies from his daddy. We, when in the teaching that I did on Joseph, I taught you that while people teach that he went from the pit to the palace in one fellow swoop, that's not true. Joseph started managing the family business first. Then he moved into managing Potiphar's estate, which is a, a, a private estate. Then he moved into managing uh, the prison with governmental subjects. Then he moved into managing Pharaoh's affairs and being um, the governor over Egypt. Where do you think he learned this from? The Bible tells you where he learned it from. Where did he learn it from? Let's look back at verse 35. After Jacob did all the work of separating his stuff from Laban's stuff, the Bible tells you that he placed them in the care of his sons. All right. Verse 36. So he brought them into the family business. He started teaching them young. This is for the people who have children or may want to, you know, bring in some family members, some younger people into whatever you're building go ahead and start doing it. We see what's happening here. You're, you're setting them up for success. Verse 36 says, then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob continued to tend to the rest of Laban's stocks. I mean, flocks. I say stocks. Sorry, I've been talking about stocks all morning. Um, so in verse 37 through 42, where we're going to start studying, we learned that about Jacob's breeding program, right? Jacob is starting to create a breeding program. What we're about to witness is this man develop a rinse and repeat strategy that will ensure multiplication. And you know, I like to talk about rinse and repeat strategies, especially if you watch the podcast on Sunday with how I save my first 10K and also how I save my first 20K. You know, I'm talking about rinsing and repeating. You don't have to reinvent the wheel when you got the infrastructure around it, which is why you need strategy. So the Bible is literally about to take us into Jacob's breeding program. Let's let's let let's learn from Jacob. What can we learn? Strategy six is think and strategize for multiplication. Your strategy six is to think and strategize for multiplication. Verse 37 through 39 reads, Jacob, however, took fresh cut branches from poplar, almond and plane trees and made white strips on them um, by peeling the bark and exposing the inner white wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches. Okay, so Jacob knows that he's at a disadvantage, right? What it appears to be a disadvantage, but he doesn't let that stop him. That's what a lot of people do. A lot of people let the perceived disadvantage stop them as opposed to seeing the disadvantage as an opportunity. You have to see every perceived disadvantage as an opportunity to multiply, okay? 
Your mindset matters. So since he knows that God is with him and is committed to ensuring his generational prosperity, he follows the plan of heaven to begin creating the infrastructure for long-term success. What does Jacob do? He, uh, I mean, not Jacob, Joseph. Yeah, Jacob. What does Jacob do? Jacob cuts the branches from the trees, peels black back the bark, places the branches in the water trough so that the animals will see them when they drink and mate. What we're witnessing here is Jacob partnering with God to execute a strategy for advancement. Now, the strategy might seem weird to onlookers. What is Jacob doing? Why would he put these tree barks in this water trough when they're mating? It doesn't make sense. Well, you're right. It doesn't make sense, but it makes God. God. Jacob did not just think of this idea. This was God telling him what to do. Just like God tells you what to do after you do certain steps, he'll keep giving you the plan, but you have to do the first step. But I also need you to remember, God's strategies will never make sense. Never, ever make sense right? This strategy doesn't make sense in this Bible. Verse 39 tells you they made it in front of the branches and they bore young that were streaked and speckled or spotted. So your strategy seven is to keep the goal in front of you because what you see, you will become. But this is also your warning. Your warning is make sure you keep the goal in front of you because what you see, you will become. And this is what we learned from the animal production. The animals started producing after what they saw. Remember, Jacob separated the spotted and the sprinkle, the spotted animals, the striped animals, and he gave them to his sons. There's a three days, they're three days journey away. What Jacob is dealing with now are purebred animals, right? However, when Jacob started to implement that strategy from heaven and put those branches in front of these um in front of these animals what happens they started to produce after what they saw the animals literally started to produce the bible says their offspring it says and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted so you have pure animals bearing young that were streaked speckled or spotted just based off of what Jacob put in their line of sight. Right. Another lesson in this is that what you see while you're vulnerable and you know, you're vulnerable when you're mating, when you're, you know, engaging, you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to say it publicly, but you know, you're vulnerable when you're in that position. Right. And so are the animals. The animals are vulnerable as they're mating, which what you're exposed to when you're vulnerable is what you're subject to uh, produce. Let me say it this way. What you see while you're vulnerable is what you will subject your offspring to. What you see while you're vulnerable is what you will have the ability to subject what you're producing to. The parent animals were not spotted, but they produced spotted kids. Why? Because of what they were doing, what they were looking at when they were vulnerable as they were producing. So we see that though it really didn't impact the parents, it did impact their offspring and it morphed the genetic line. Y'all following me with this? What the parents saw when they were vulnerable as they were producing morphed the genetic makeup of their offspring and the evidence is worn on the bodies of their offspring. What the parents saw had the ability to morph the genetic line. These were purebred bred animals. That is also your lesson. We can learn from this, you know, a strategy to keep what you want to happen in front of you. But you can also learn a lesson that what you start to do when you're vulnerable, what, what you produce out of that vulnerability is going to show up in what you were looking at. Verse 40 through, yeah, verse 40 says, Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves but made the rest face the streaked and dark colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. So this moves us into strategy eight, keep things separate. Keep things separate, keep the main thing the main thing. Jacob set his new flock aside and didn't allow them to co-mingle with Laban's flock. Why? Because he wanted to keep producing, he wanted them to keep producing after their own kind, okay? 
Verse 41 says, I, I'm sorry, I'm moving so fast because I'm going to have to hop off of here. Verse 41 says, whenever the younger females were in heat, Jacob would, would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. Verse nine, your, I mean, not verse nine, your strategy nine is rinse and repeat. We just saw Jacob rinse and repeat. What did he rinse and repeat? Since Jacob saw that the strategy worked with the first batch of animals, all he had to do was rinse and repeat for the next batch. This is similar to what I did when I, you know, found the financial strategies that worked for me and started partnering with God. I never have to reinvent the wheel. Once I create the infrastructure surrounding the idea, all I have to do is keep doing it over and over again. You don't have to create it again. The hardest part will be the creation of it. Once you get it created, you never have to touch it again once you've mastered it. It's a rinse and repeat system. So we're seeing Jacob rinse and repeat. He saw that it worked for the first batch, rinse and repeat. That's all you got to keep doing. That's all wealthy people do. They keep doing the same thing that worked. Keep doing the same thing that worked, y'all. Verse 42 says, but, the anim but if the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones went to Jacob. So what we just saw Jacob do is conduct a SWOT analysis. Strategy nine, I mean, strategy 10, conduct a SWOT analysis. And if you don't know what a SWOT analysis is, let me, I'm going to tell you. But we were first have to understand that Jacob was, was interested in building a strong legacy, which means that he was interested in only utilizing what will produce the best results. So since he was hands-on in building the infrastructure, he had enough knowledge to understand strengths and weaknesses. So essentially, he conducted a SWOT analysis for his breeding program. And so a SWOT analysis here is a strategic planning tool used by businesses and organizations to identify and evaluate internal strengths and weaknesses, as well as external opportunities and threats. So let's walk through what Jacob, let's walk through Jacob's SWOT analysis. Number one, what is a strength? When you're thinking about conducting a SWOT analysis, the strengths are the internal attributes and resources that give an organization an advantage over others in, achieve, in achieving the objective. I'm going to drop it in the chat if you take taking notes. Okay, so if you're conducting a SWOT analysis, which we're about to see Jacob do, it is the internal attributes and resources that give an organization an advantage over others in achieving a, an objective. So what were the strengths here? Jacob learned that he could manipulate the genetic makeup of the flock to cause them to reproduce after what they saw. So he created the plan and he stuck to it, rinse and repeat right? That is the strength. He, he was hands-on enough. He created the strategy. He tested the strategy. The strategy work is going to work every time. It's going to hit every time, especially why? Because the strategy came from heaven. Heaven strategies always hit, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting amped. Let me time down. He created this plan and he stuck with it. SWOT analysis strength. The W in SWOT analysis it are uh, to account for the weaknesses. These are the internal factors that may inhibit an organization's ability to achieve its goals. So what are the weaknesses to uh, that may impede um, Jacob's breeding program? Well, since the flock would produce after what was in their line of sight, he kept the newly spotted offspring away from the non-spotted so that like kind would produce, would keep producing after itself. So the weakness that Jacob was ever able to assess was if I don't keep these two flocks separate, they will begin to co-mingle and I will lose the production that I am doing. Right. So since he knew because he he understood the strength, he also knew that there was a potential for weakness if you don't keep these two things separate. Y'all rocking with me? Oh, oh, in the oh, in the SWOT analysis refers to opportunities, right? So these are the external factors that the organization could exploit to its advantage. So Jacob took advantage of the natural life cycle. The female animals were going to mate when they were in heat. 
So Jacob decided to use their natural desire, desire and opportunity to continue growing his business. Remember, everything in life either operates in cycles or by timelines or timetables. And sometimes the trend is your friend. But you'll only be able to identify the cycles or the trend if you've done your due diligence, right? So don't be frustrated when God hasn't given you a team to help you yet because you need to learn the fundamentals of how this thing is going to work. You need to be on the ground level. You need to be on the floor. You need to know how this thing works that you're building because you won't be able to teach someone else how to help you run it if you don't know the natural cycle of what it is you're building. And what you're building does have a rhythm. It does have a cycle, right? And they do, and even in, in every rhythm, in every cycle, you will have opportunities. We don't see anywhere that Jacob had help with this breathing program. He's building it from the ground up with insight from heaven, with information from God. I'm not making this up. It's right here in the text. T. So we just moved from uh, O. Now let's look at the T. The T in SWOT analysis refers to, let me drop it in the chat, threats. These are the external factors that could potentially harm this organization's performance. So Jacob realizes that he needs to maintain the strength of his breeding program, right? Excuse me. So he decides not only to, well, so he decides to only allow the stronger females to mate in front of the branches he created so that they will produce after what they saw. That is a threat. He knew that if I let these weak animals mate in front of what it, uh, in front of these branches that I've created, then they're going to continue to produce weak offspring. I don't want that. That is a threat. So I am only going to allow the strong um, animals to mate in front of my stuff. If you haven't liked the video, please like the video, right? So Jacob was able, because he was integral in working with the infrastructure, working with the strategy that God gave him, working through it all, he was able to conduct this SWOT analysis that would allow him to what verse 43 says, and I'm going to read the text. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and, cannibal, and, and camels and donkeys. And this brings us back full circle. Jacob's ability to develop infrastructure around a strategy from heaven allow him to be prosperous. Go back and look at how the Bible talks about Abraham and Isaac's financial success. And you'll see that there is a very visible through line through all of them. Even when we think, even when we bring Joseph in, there is a very visible through line of success. Right? So when we think about Jesus's reprimand in Matthew 8, verse 11 through 12, and we're bringing this back full circle when he says, I say to you, and this is after he is talking with the centurion and he compliments him on his, uh, on his faith, Right? Right before he agrees to fully heal the servant, Jesus says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see here that the clearest through line between father, son, and grandfather is that they were prosperous and wealthy. So when Jesus is speaking about people taking their place at the feast with these great men, he's alluding to their ability to do the same thing. What is the same thing to become prosperous and wealthy? Unfortunately, the children of the kingdom, you and I, because of our, in, our, our refusal to abide by kingdom laws and politics, will not sit down at the feast, but will suffer due to our own unbelief. That's all I got today. Now, Strategy Tuesday, did y'all learn something? I hope y'all learned a lot because that's all I got. Um, yeah, this is what I want y'all to do, though. I want you all to go back and listen to the study I did. Now that, now that we have Jacob, go back and listen to the study I did on Abraham, the study I did on Isaac, replay this one, and then put Jacob's study after this one. 
And you'll be able to see as we tracked four generations, the through line for all four of them was obedience and the ability to be wealthy. So when Jesus is telling them, telling his disciples, right, that, you know, other people are going to come in and reap the benefits of the kingdom. But the, the people that it's for, the people who should be beneficiaries of the kingdom, they're not going to get it because of their unbelief, because they won't use the kingdom principles that are laid out in the Bible, right, to create generational wealth. Therefore, everyone else is going to benefit but my kids. And that is a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because the kingdom was is your inheritance that was prepared for you since the foundations of the world. Y'all want to y'all y'all make sure to join me Thursday for this kingdom teaching. Uh this, this is a heavy one. This is the most important one that I've ever taught. So I want y'all to make sure y'all join me on Thursday. Um, but I say all that to say, y'all, um, <laughs> we can use these biblical strategies for advancement. We see here that the first thing Jacob had to do was to use what seemed insignificant. What is God encouraging? What do you have in your hands that seems so insignificant that you're like, of course, this won't make me any money. Put it in the chat. Tell me. What is, what do you have? What are your strengths? What are your gifts? What is the thing that you do with ease that you are saying this will never produce generational wealth? Could it be that that is the very thing that will produce generational wealth for your lineage, for you, right? Don't discredit the thing that seems insignificant. When I tell y'all that I used to think that my ability to strategize, uh, my uh, my ability to build infrastructure around ideas and move very quickly through things, I used to take it for granted. I used to think, oh, this isn't going to be anything. This isn't, you know, no one cares about this until I realized that that is really a strength of mine, that I can take you from idea to production in a minute through a strategy session. Oh, and if you want to book a strategy session with me, do so at BriannaWhiteside.com. But my strength is that I can take you from idea to production in an hour, right? I discredited that because it felt so easy to me. However, it's not always easy to other people. So when I stopped counting out what looked insignificant, I was able to build infrastructure around a gift that God had given me and create a business strategy sessions. I was also able to cultivate my gift to give you this free advice here every Tuesday for Strategy Tuesday. I had to stop looking at what may have looked insignificant with my natural eye and believe and trust what God was leading me into. And I had to move into production. And y'all have seen me. If y'all have been rocking with me since the last since December, when I did the strategy planning session for 2024, you've seen me move from idea to production. You've seen it. You've witnessed it. You may not have known what you were witnessing, but you were witnessing me move from idea to production. It's that easy. But you can't um, you can't discredit wh what you what God is giving you. You can't abandon it. You can't lay it down. You can't say this ain't what you gave them. It don't matter. It's going to work for you. Why? Because God cares about your lineage. He is the God of your great grandma, your grandma, your mama, you, and he will be the God of your kids. We have to stop discrediting these things and become um, not just hearers of the word. Y'all know what I mean? But doers. All of these strategy sessions, I'm showing y'all how people have moved into great significance or we're learning lessons from them on what to do or what not to do. Strategic advancement. The Bible has everything you need. If only you would read it. But not only that, after you read it, you have to decide that you are going to do something, y'all. We have to do things. That is the only way that we're going to elevate in society. 
We got to do. We have to be doers. And it will be inconvenient for you. I'm going to tell you this now. It's going to be inconvenient. When God starts to give you ideas, they're going to they're going to come at inopportune times. They're going to stretch you. They're going to seem very difficult to do. You won't have this necessary support that you may feel that you need. But he already knew that. And he, he gave it to you in that season anyway. Why? Because embedded in what he told you to do was your ability to do it. No matter what the ex, you know, external circumstances said. When he told you to do it, what we understand, what he also understand is I've just given you the power to do it. It left my mouth because you now have the power to do it. Right? But your unbelief, I know we like to say the opposite of faith is fear is not true. The opposite of faith is unbelief. Your unbelief will trick you out of opportunities that were destined for you and mock you for not having anything. That's how wicked it is. You have to come into agreement. And the way that you come into agreement is moving into production of whatever God has been telling you to do. This is obedience. This is what we call obedience. You move into alignment through deciding to do what he told you to do. Even if it is uncomfortable, even if you got to wake up earlier and go to sleep later, I'm not telling you not to rest. But I am telling you, you're going to have to put some skin in the game because it'll never be a great opportunity to become who God created you to be. It'll never be a, a, a good time for you to become who God created you to be. You know what I mean? Take me, for example. And let's let's go back to the text when we're when Jacob when God gives Jacob this strategy about what to do and putting these branches in front of these mating animals, that strategy didn't make sense. It To the natural naked eye, it would not look profitable. That doesn't look like it's going to do anything, right? Bring it to me. When I knew I had to leave my career, God, if you want to prosper me, you can prosper me while I'm still in my career. It's going great. But God's like, no, I want to prosper you. I need you to leave this thing though. And I'm like, you sure? That didn't make sense, y'all, to leave job security that I could have for the rest of my life. As a matter of fact, let me tell y'all something. This month, we're in the month of March. My tenure case, had I not resigned, will be going up for evaluation this very week. This very week, they will be making decisions on me being tenured, a tenured professor. This very week. But I didn't go up no matter how good my case was, because God said, I need you to come out. The strategy didn't make sense in my mind, but the promise that I stood on was that my latter days were going to be greater than my former days. So in order for me to get that promise, I had to do what God told me to do right now, even though it didn't make sense. And I didn't have, when I resigned, I did not have the next step. And I still don't have the next step yet. We're, we're stepping Right. I'm, I'm, it's, it's becoming a little more clearer, but I couldn't see anything when I was in the decision of the re, of the resignation. All I could see is my feet. I couldn't see ahead. I couldn't see like I'm generally able to see like years ahead. No, I couldn't. All I could see is my feet, my feet directly in front of me. You know, this Bible, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. He literally had a lamp on my feet. That's all I had. Right. And it was scary. And it, it felt like the most inconvenient time because why would you tell me to come out when I'm about to finally get job security? And this is a job that I worked for my entire life, right? That wouldn't make sense. That strategy doesn't make sense. You could elevate me another way, but God's strategies will never make sense. In fact, when God wants to elevate you, it'll appear that he is decreasing you. When Jacob made that decision to tell Laban to give me the spotted ones, they were not the, the dominant flock. The non-spotted ones were the dominant flock. So to the naked eye, it looks like Jacob is being what? Decreased. God's ways will look like you being decreased, but it's really the arrow. Y'all know how it's the arrow? They pull it back to shoot you forward. So I knew that. I did that. People still ask me, why did you make that decision? And I just said, he told me to, 
What you gonna do next? I don't know. Who you going with? I don't know. What you gonna do? Mm-hmm. So you just out here? Yes. Walking by faith, not by sight. Uncomfortable, 100%. Inconvenient, 1,000%. In purpose, 100%. Am I in full expectation that God is going to God? Yes. He has to. He has to. You know what I mean? So I, I use Jacob's story. Um, I use Jacob's story to show you a pathway. To also bring back into remembrance that when Jesus is talking about prosperity, generally he's also talking about these three generations who we've walked through their success for the last three weeks, right? We walked through their success generationally. And if you go back to Joseph, you'll see we walked through four generations. Every person secured the wealth of their family by obeying God the wealth of their lineage by obeying God. Abraham, leave your father's house and go where I will show you. Isaac, leave this place and you will end up in Gerar. But he didn't know he was going to Gerar. So <clears throat> leave this what leave this place where you're at, leave your comfort and go to the place where I will tell you and stay there for a while, which is what God said to Isaac. And we learn in Isaac's case, he sold in the land when nobody else was reaping, but he sold in the recession he sold in the land and reaped a hundredfold. That is the, the strategy I just taught you last week. Put Jacob's story on here. We see that this man became very wealthy by what? Doing what God told him to do, executing on a strategy that didn't look like it would make sense, but it made God. What God is telling you to do, when he's telling you to do something, he's inviting you into elevation. The ideas that he won't let you shake, he won't let you walk away from, those are your elevation ideas. Those are those are the ideas, the ones you're discrediting, the ones you're saying they're not significant enough, they're not big enough. The only way they become big enough is if you cultivate them. The only way that they become big is if you do the work when they're small to keep growing them. You have to keep growing them. They are in seed form right now. I get how scary that is and how frustrating that is. I've been in seed form for so long, a very, very, very long time. But every time I obeyed, every time I did something, I did advance to another level. And guess what happened? My gifts got bigger. My gifts got heavier. I learned more strategies. I became more financially independent. Like all of these things started to happen as I continue. So your goal is to continue. You don't have to be the smartest person. You may not even have to be the best person. You just need to be the most consistent person. Consistency will get you there. Someone asked me, Brianna, are you going to do a teaching on discipline? And I'm like, for what? Everything I do is talking about discipline. <clears throat> you know, discipline, making hard decisions, sticking to the plan, giving your, keeping your word to yourself, keeping your word to God, doing the hard thing, showing up when no one else shows up. And then you'll, next thing you know, you'll see heaven and earth conspire together to bring forth the promise. How are you going to get the promises if you don't do your part? This is why we're not where we need to be because we're we're just praying. And I think you should pray. But after you pray, you're going to have to go in and strategize. If you get a prophetic word, you need to um, go ahead and say, okay, God, and I've said this to y'all before, what is required of me? What is my strategy to bring this thing to pass? Majority of your prophetic words are conditional, y'all. They're conditional. So could it be that maybe you got a prophetic word and even though the prophet didn't say that there was a condition on it because you didn't really know what you were supposed to do with the word, you was like, okay, I believe. But after you believe, you sh there should have been another step. You should have went and took this word into a meeting with God and said, what is my part? Because we are in partnership. What is my part? What is required of me? So what if these things haven't come to pass for you because you just decided not to partner and do your part? And I know sometimes they don't say you got to do something, but y'all, the truth is that you do sometimes. 
majority of this is hinging on your willing to your willingness to be uncomfortable, your willingness to be obedient. It will get you there. Right. So even if you have prophetic words right now, they're still pending. There may be still time for you to go and take them words, review, review them and take them words and ask God, what is required of me? What is the strategy? Have I missed the step? What do we need to do? You know what I mean? Because you may just may not have known. And I know I didn't know a lot of stuff either. But as I've studied and as I've matured and as I've grown, I've learned like, oh, I was supposed to do something. Well, y'all didn't. Y'all should have said that. You know what I mean? Y'all should have said that and I would have done it. Um, but this is your buy-in. Don't discredit what God is giving you. Don't discredit. Don't think it that's so small. You remember when he, when the, when the, when, I, is it Jeremiah? When uh, he said, I'm like, I'm, I'm a child. I can't speak to the people that you're telling me to speak to. And God says, don't say that. This is what I'm telling you. Don't say that what you're carrying is insignificant. It's not important. Don't say that no one is going to, you know, want what you have. Don't say that you're going to always have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Don't say if it's one thing and another. Don't say that. Because what you're doing with your mouth is moving it into production. You're moving it into production with your mouth in the spirit realm. Which is why I tell y'all, watch your mouth. Also, when you're building anything, you need to do the spiritual work first, which is in prayer. And if you need a prayer strategy, I did drop it on my YouTube channel this, this week. or No, last week, I think um, the strategy that helped me learn how to pray for an hour. So if you need to see that and if you need to do that, go ahead and look at the strategy. No shade if you need help growing in your prayer life. I just grew in mine this year. Because I didn't enjoy praying because I didn't feel like I was making progress until I asked the Holy Spirit, okay, I know I need to pray. I need a strategy. Because this five-minute drive by prayer, it ain't getting it. You know what I mean? I need to do a little bit more legislating. And that is when he gave me that strategy that I shared with you all. And so many people have emailed me or, or left a testimonial under that, that video saying, it helped me too. This strategy helped me too. Y'all know what I'm saying? Okay. So when you're building, do the, do the spiritual work, but then decide that you're about to move in production with your hands. Okay. Stop sitting on your gifts and talents. If the prophets have been prophesying that there is a wealth transfer, it's not just coming in one way. And I, I'm going to always say that it's just not coming in crypto, even though I'm in crypto, it's just not coming in the stock market, even though I'm in the stock market. It's just not, it's coming through your gifts and talents. It's been transferring for years now. It's coming through what you're able to produce. It's coming through so many avenues. God would not be hindered to one avenue. And I want us to understand that he, if he's a multidimensional God, that means he's going to use multidimensional ways. But what if we are in a season of, uh, or in a position of weeping and gnashing the teeth, as the Bible says, because we decided not to look at the avenues that he's placed before us. There is always so many avenues around you. They're encircling around you right now, waiting for waiting for you to give them an opportunity. There, You have space and opportunity, y'all, to create generational wealth every day. Every day, your Bible says that he loads you with benefits. Daily, he loads you with benefits. You have a benefit package. Every day, it's reloaded. What are you doing with what you're given every day with these downloads? Or are you just sitting on the downloads or ignoring them and saying, oh, I had this I, I had this thought today. And then you go scroll on TikTok. Well, you we see, Jacob had a thought and he moved in production the same day. You see what I'm saying here? Daily, you are getting all of these opportunities to succeed. But we sometimes we're the drama. And this year, especially as we're about to move into Q2, we need to stop being a drama and we need to partner. Q2, if y'all rocking with me, I'm rocking with you. We're going to dominate in 2024 because we're standing on Bible. And Bible always works. By standing on Bible, doing what it says always works. Remember what I told y'all when we came into the new year. What did I say? Old strategies are not going to work for you. The strategies that other people have used in other seasons, though they should produce what they say, they're not going to work because they're not tailored to what God is needing you to do. So you need to go to God. What strategy do I need to use? 
we see him give an unusual strategy to Jacob. Jacob wasn't that smart. You know what I mean? We called this man, he was a trickster. You could tell he wasn't that smart because he stole the blessings. His mama helped him. So now when we're moving into, when he's about to move into production for his breeding program, he's partnered with heaven. He's not trying to trick. He's trying to be honest and honorable and integral, right? Which is why he says, let me find out why he says, and then I'm going to have to hop off here in four minutes. Let's see. He says, and my honesty will testify for me in the future. My honesty will testify for me in the future. Whenever you check on the wages you have paid me. My honesty. So now we're saying he's trying to be honest here. And he's partnering with heaven because he's changed his ways. God is giving him this idea, which was in through a breeding program, to create generational wealth because he still cares about Joseph and the rest of the tribes of Israel. He cares about them all. And he gives them the strategy that seems like it'll never work. It seems crazy. People could have been laughing at him. But it's only crazy until it hit. And God's strategy and God's ideas always hit. They're going to always bring in the bag. So why people are saying, oh, you need to secure the bag. You do. Go ahead and do what God told you to do. And he's going to help you secure it. Because there's no way Jacob would have known that just by manipulating what they saw, as they were procreating, that he was able to change the genetic makeup and therefore switch the narrative and become, as the Bible says, what's that last scripture say? Oh, the last scripture says, and in this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks, plural, and female and male servants, plural, and camels, plural, and donkeys, plural. This is about multiplication. This is about plurality, right? We're standing on Bible this year on this channel. I don't know what other people are doing. We're standing on Bible, and I'm showing y'all how the Bible can work for you. If you just obey it and you decide, I'm going to dominate this year. Come back into alignment with who you were created to be, and you know who you were created to be, we're going to go over it Thursday, but you were given do, um, dominion in Genesis 1. And I'm going to get off here. I'm going to do this quick recap because I can't stop doing it. And well, I'm going to get off here. You were given dominion in Genesis 1. You were given a body to exercise that dominion in Genesis 2. You lost the dominion with the fall of man. So when Isaiah prophesies that the government is going to be upon Christ's shoulders, he's referring to the government of the kingdom. We lost the kingdom dwelling with the fall of man. So when Isaiah is prophesying that this government will be on Jesus's shoulders, he's bringing back the kingdom government, which is the government of dominion. Daniel also gives us that vision where he says that I saw uh, Jesus stepping into this, gov this dominion. And basically he says that um, the rule will be everlasting, right? So Daniel is corroborating Isaiah's, uh, Isaiah's claim. When Jesus clocks in, we have John the Baptist saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus comes and clocks into time, he starts to preach the good news, which is the herald, the good news of the kingdom, which is the message of the kingdom. And he's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. All throughout his time on earth, he is walking and demonstrating the kingdom. This is what's inside of the kingdom. And, you're, and I think Galatians tells you that the kingdom was your inheritance since the foundations of the world which means that before you lost dominion, God had a reinstatement plan for you, but Christ had to die in order for you to get your inheritance. That's what naturally happens when someone you know, has an inheritance, someone has to die. So when he dies for you and he dies for your sins and he, he, he goes, he dies and rises again, he comes back to earth for 40 days, according to Acts, to talk about the kingdom with, the, with his disciples. And then he makes his final ascension. When he makes his final ascension, the kingdom of heaven fully un unlocks, which is why your Bible says, come in, right? He wants you to come into the kingdom. He wants you to come back into your rightful place. However, we have decided to replace kingdom living with religious politics, and they're never going to work for us. They're never going to work for us. 
Um, I have to go because I have to hop on this meeting. Be sure to join me Thursday night um, for another installment of the Kingdom series. And uh, I have to hop off here. If you want to book a strategy session with me, feel free to do so at BriannaWhiteside.com. I got to go, y'all. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.